So today my talk is, uh, I had to come up with a title last night, so I, I called it Breaking Bad from the Audio Industry's Circle of Confusion. And uh, basically that's, the, the whole term Circle of Confusion is a term that uh, Floyd, in, Floyd Tool actually uh, penned a few years ago. And uh, if we just look at our audio industry, uh, there's different segments, and, but it all starts out with capturing some sound uh, at the recording studio or at, or at a live event, and we process it, and then we reproduce it. And the reproduction can be a live performance in a uh, concert hall or a stadium, and or it can be, uh, or we can store that performance and reproduce it through a cinema, for example. And then on the other side, we have uh, this consumer audio industry, which includes the home, the automobile, headphones, multimedia, and more and more today, people are consuming music uh, mobily. So it's through headphones, it's through cars, or it's through some kind of mobile laptop device, computer speakers, increasingly it's Bluetooth, wireless. And we, we, we listen to audio less and less in our home, sitting down on our couch and, and listening to it very seriously. But the goal here is to, uh, I think from a production side, is to produce the best sound we can. So we want to make great sounding recordings. And from the sound reproduction side, we want to reproduce recordings that sound great. So we want to accurately reproduce what the artist intended. And that's a word that you hear a lot these days. It's thrown, thrown around quite a bit, but uh, uh, everyone is not necessarily doing that. So, but how do we know what is great sound? Uh, it's a subjective opinion, right? So we have to listen, but when we do, we get trapped in this circle of confusion. So here's our term. We listen to things through uh, sounds, through loudspeakers, and uh, you know, on the consumer side, when we're evaluating loudspeakers, we're listening to recordings that are made using various microphones, EQ, reverb effects, and those devices are evaluated through loudspeakers. So you can see right away we're, we're trapped in this circle of confusion. And the problem is that neither the loudspeaker monitors or the listening rooms are standardized. So uh, there's this question, you know, is this loudspeaker I'm listening to and EQing and processing sounds, is it actually neutral or accurate? Is the room actually calibrated or do we really know what's happening in the room and how it's affecting the sounds? And, and on the uh, consumer side, we're listening to speakers, we're trying to evaluate them. Uh, but we never know for sure if these recordings are actually accurate or neutral. So as a result, because of this confusion, there's a lot of variability in the recordings themselves. And that creates a problem for consumers who, who are listening to them for, for pleasure or for manufacturers who are using these recordings to evaluate their products. So, so in order to uh, create the art and appreciate it, we have to have some commonality between these two domains where we create the art and where we appreciate it. And we can only break the circle of confusion when, when the professional monitors through which recordings are made and the consumer playback systems, whether it's a car, a home speaker, or a headphone, are similar to each other. And only then will the consumer truly hear what the artist intended. So we need, we need standards in order to get to this goal. And in the music industry, there are no standards right now for either loudspeakers, rooms, or headphones. So uh, basically, in, in the, when recordings are made, uh, the, the speakers, uh, there are no meaningful measurements or standards, or there's no, measure, there's no calibration standards. If you look at the broadcast TV film, there's, you, know, you could argue maybe there's too many standards. There's EBU, ITU, IEC, ISO, and for theater and film, there's SIMPTI standards. But if you carefully look at these, the standards are so loose that they don't guarantee consistent quality, and as a result, people largely ignore them. So as a result, we have many opinions about what sounds good, but few of them are based on scientific investigations. And of course, marketing departments tell us that audio perfection has already been achieved. But we know that they said the same thing almost a century ago, when Edison first came out with a phonograph, they did blind tests and they compared a singer singing live to a, a phonograph recording and people said they couldn't tell the difference. They were indistinguishable. Okay. Uh, 
So good sound cannot be consistently achieved unless you can accurately and reliably measure it. So you have to do careful subjective measurements, which involve listening, using listeners. And in parallel, you have to do objective measurements uh, so you can characterize the sound sources or the loudspeakers. And when you do both of them carefully, you start to learn what's known as psychoacoustic knowledge, which is the relationship between the perception and measurement of sound. A scientific approach allows us to understand what people like, why they like it or dislike it in an audio product. So those are the subjective ratings. And then those subjective ratings basically identify which measurements you need to pay attention to when you're measuring the loudspeakers or the headphones. And once you understand what measurements are important, you can then come up with a specification or a standard and you can consistently make good sound. So what is a scientific listening test? Uh, my definition, it has to be sensitive to what you're trying to measure. So it, you have to be, it has to be very uh, able to bring out differences in the products. It, 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 you can't, it can't be a casual exercise. Uh, the ratings that it produces has to, it has to produce numbers. So, you, and those numbers have to be repeatable. Otherwise, you, you're just looking at noise. And finally, the ratings have to be directly related to real audible differences, so you have to remove all these so-called nuisance biases. And over the years, we've, we've looked at different nuisance variables that can affect or bias a listening test, and there's basically three types. Uh, there's psychological or physiological nuisance variables. Those are the ones on the left-hand side, and they include sighted biases, the listener's hearing, how much experience they have or training, what sort of expectations do they have, and when you have multiple listeners participating, there's always a chance that you can have some, uh, some interaction between people, which is not a good thing. On the right-hand side, we have physical or acoustical nuisance variables, so you have to make sure the relative levels are, are well-matched between the products. You want to remove loudness differences. You want, if, you, if you're listening to loudspeakers, you have to control the, the positions of the speakers as well as the listeners. And then uh, we found over the years that, we, we, that listeners, when they're hearing a single source, they tend to be more critical than, than when they're listening to two or more sources. So uh, the, the ratings between a mono, a stereo, and a multi-channel test are very much in agreement, but we find people are more discriminating when they hear just a single source. And then finally, there's, there's uh, nuisance variables that, that the experimenter has to deal with, including the statistical design, the analysis, and how they interpret the results. So when I first joined Harman in 1993, uh, at that point they were not doing blind tests at all. All the products were designed using sighted listening. Uh, the listening tests were very casual and uh, often the, uh, the marketing guy would fly out from the East Coast and under great pressure to get the product out the door, uh, he would sit down with the engineer and, and very quickly determine what needs to be done to the speaker to make it marketable or sound good. So uh, there was a lot of resistance to doing blind tests and many of the engineers felt uh, that they've been doing designing speakers for years and they're immune from these biases. So the first thing I had to do was set up a blind test where we had four loudspeakers that came in and rated them under blind conditions and then a couple of days later they did the same test sighted. And these are, the, these are the differences we got between those two tests. And loudspeakers G and D were uh, the most expensive loudspeakers. They were $5,000. And in the sighted test, the scores went up. Uh, speakers S, which was a, a, an inexpensive home theater in a box, the scores went down. And what we found was, uh, this was before we had speaker movers, so we found that in the, in the blind test, the positional effects were huge. The program effects were also significant, but uh, when they could see the products, you could move them around, you could change the music, and their scores never changed. So in other words, they weren't responding to real changes in the sound when they could see the products. So from that point on, we always did all of our tests blind. Uh, we built this new room, uh, which has a pneumatic speaker shuffler. It puts each speaker into the exact same position, so that positional biases how the speaker excites the room resonances, the, the pattern of reflections are the same for each speaker being evaluated. And then of course a piece of grill cloth comes down and the listener can't see the identity of the products. And uh, this is how all the tests are done now. 
And uh, we also train our listeners because that's a nuisance variable. And uh, we found, as many people have in the audio science community, that trained listeners are simply more discriminating and more consistent. So you don't need as many listeners. You can get statistical confidence with 10 to 15 listeners, and you'd have to use maybe several hundred untrained people to get the same confidence. The other good thing about a trained listener is that they give you very, if you train them right, they give you very precise information about what they like or dislike about the product. Whereas an untrained listener can tell you what they like, you see, might be due to cultural or uh, maybe a difference in training. Uh, the other thing we built in this room, uh, up until this point we didn't have a way of testing in-wall products or speakers designed to go in or near a wall, so we built this, this three-sided wall that's adjust, attached to a, a servo motor and we can spin it in any, any one of three directions, any, any one of three positions uh, within a couple of seconds and do a blind test on these, these types of products. So we have uh, several of these uh, now and we're building some in China. So the first thing we test with our listeners is whether they have normal hearing. So they, they, once they pass an audiometric exam, we th they, then, they then go through a training process, which uh, I described yesterday in a workshop on critical listening. So we've developed some software which you can download for free uh, called Harmon How to Listen. And it teaches listeners how to uh, rate and identify different distortions added to music. Uh, but this has raised this question uh, over and over whether uh, through training someone are you biasing them to like a certain type of sound. And that's something we don't want to do because most of the products we design are aimed for consumers who aren't necessarily trained. So if there is a difference between a trained or untrained listener, we don't really have a good test. And uh, I've, I've argued over the years that I think sound reproduction is fundamentally different from other things in life where I believe experience and, and taste, it really matters. For example, food and wine, uh, music taste, all, all of those things are highly individualistic. But there's something fundamentally different about sound reproduction where we have natural references throughout our lives. We know what voices sound like, we know what pianos sound like. And when we hear a distortion of that sound that's, that deviates too far from natural, we can sort of say, no, that's, that's not right. So I, I, I believe that uh, everyone has the inherent ability to judge whether something is good or bad when it comes to sound reproduction. But it's always nice to have some data. So in 19, sorry, 2003, we did a pretty ex extensive test where we brought in over 300 listeners from outside Harmon. And they all went through a, a double-blind test where they compared four loudspeakers and uh, we asked them to rate them on a scale from 0 to 10. And what we found was that these different groups of untrained listeners essentially rank ordered these speakers in the same order as the trained listeners. The only difference was that they tended to rate things higher on the scale than the trained listeners. And as an individual and as a group, they were much more uh, variable in their ratings. You know, that there's too much bass, I prefer my MP3 earbuds. No, they, they just said this is the best sound we ever heard and we give everything 10 out of 10. So uh, they were just not discriminating, but they also thought that this was pretty good sound. <coughs> so here are the, uh, the anechoic measurements that we take in our chamber. I'll describe these in a little, uh, in a couple of slides later. But you can right away see that there's some strong visual correlations between the, the shape of the curves, how smooth they are, and what listeners think about them. So uh, speaker P and uh, I, which were the most preferred, tended to have very technically good and acoustic, acoustic uh, responses. And the speakers that were the were less preferred, B and M, you can see that there's, there's deviations off axis. Can't even see these curves, can you? Sorry about that. Uh, well, take my word. Uh, <laughs> uh, these are very squiggly lines indicating lots of resonances, and this one has a big, uh, big hole in the sound power response. So 
So the next question uh, we ask is whether from measurements alone can we predict how speakers, how, how listeners will rate a speaker in a listening room, a typical listening room. So the sort of measurements we do, these were developed really back in the 1980s by Floyd Toole at the National Research Council and they've been somewhat refined in the intervening years. But what we do is we take 70 measurements in 10 degree increments in both the horizontal and vertical orbits around the loudspeaker and we then spatially average them so that we can remove uh, diffraction or, or interference effects. And then from those measurements, we can characterize the direct, early, and late reflected sounds in a typical room. So here is a, an example of a, of a JBL M2 uh, studio monitor. And the green curve represents the listening window, which is what, what you would hear, uh, the direct sound that you would hear if you're sitting roughly uh, on axis to the loudspeaker. The red curve is an average of the first reflections in a listening room, and then the, the blue curve is the calculated sound power. So if you were in a reverberant room that was highly reflective, this might represent what you might hear. And then these two bottom curves are the directivity indices for the sound power and the early reflections only. So, so using these measurements, uh, we did uh, uh, I guess about 10 years ago I did a really exhaustive study uh, and it was really motivated by consumer reports who uh, had been using a, a technique over 30 years for calculating accuracy scores. So when you buy consumer reports, uh, you, look, you look at the speakers they reviewed and they, they rate them on a scale from 0 to 100 based on how accurate they are. But that accuracy score is based on a single curve, which is the sound power, so they're only looking at the sound power, which right away is a, is a red flag because it's telling you that they think that we listen in reverberant rooms. Uh, they're not weighting at all the direct sound. And secondly, it's, it's based on a third octave measurement, and we know that the human ear is much better, has much better resolution at detecting resonances than one third octave. Uh, so, anyways, we did this test. It started out, I, I tested 13 Consumer Reports loudspeakers, and I found there was a, a negative correlation between their ratings and what our listeners preferred. So, uh, the higher the rating a speaker got in Consumer Reports, there was a ten tendency that our listeners actually didn't like it. So, so I knew that uh, Consumer Reports wouldn't, uh, it wouldn't do listening tests, so we, we have to provide them a model that they could use based on their measurements to, to come up with a more accurate rating. So we tested their, their products and then we tested 70 different loudspeakers and uh, this went over the course of 18 months and we had listeners rate each speaker on a scale from 0 to 10 and then based on these measurements that we do I was able to come up with a model that weights each of these measurements and I could predict uh, I could predict the uh, preference rating with an accuracy of about 86%. So uh, what we found was that you have, there's equal metrics applied to the direct sound. So the first sound that arrives at a listener is really important, but also the direct and reflective responses are also important. So you can't just look at a single curve to predict how good a speaker sounds. Equally important, we found that the bass quality alone, uh, how much bass it has, and and the, the, the flatness and the smoothness of the bass accounted for 33% of the listener's preference rating. So if you don't get the bass right, you're throwing away 33% of the, of the listener's pleasure. And the problem here is that bass is really dominated by the listening room and how it interacts with the loudspeaker. So we can't ignore the, the effect that the room has on the quality of bass. So if you just summarize, we can say that listeners, whether they're trained or untrained, can reliably identify which loudspeakers they prefer based on sound quality. And, and based on these measurements I've shown you, it, it, there's evidence that they prefer the most accurate neutral loudspeakers. And then we can reliably predict listener loudspeaker preference based on a set of comprehensive measurements. And this gives us a pretty good scientific basis for a loudspeaker standard for both professional and consumer industries that could help us break the circle of confusion. But the problem is that there's still this, this listening room. We have no standards and we have no uh, standards on the how the speaker and the room should interact with each other and how we should calibrate them.
And uh, <clears throat> so we have acoustical we have acoustical interference between the speaker, which is a sig significant source of variance. And at low frequencies, below 500 hertz, in most rooms, you have room modes, uh, solid angle gain, boundary effects, which can also cause variations. And then at higher frequencies, of course, you have room reflections. And uh, but you know, if you're trying to uh, equalize the speaker or uh, or use multiple subwoofers, that's not going to fix reflections. So this is not a loudspeaker problem. This is a, a room problem. And if you don't believe, I hope you can see this. Yeah, it's a little better. Uh, this is a this is evidence that the, that the control room is really. Uh, not, not a place that's, that things are under good control. The, the circle of confusion is well and alive in control rooms. This was a study done by Genelec back in 2001. And what it is, 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 is and Genelec make, uh, this is a very good loudspeaker, so these kinds of variations you're seeing are not from the loudspeaker, but from the loudspeaker interacting with the listening room. And what these are, are is a distribution of curves uh, measured at the, at the uh, at the console where the mixing is done. And you can see there, uh, below about uh, 200 hertz, there's a huge distribution uh, ranging from um, almost 30 dB in the bass. So there's a real serious problem uh, when we're mixing and mastering recordings. Uh, and, you know, things below 200 hertz are just not uh, calibrated. So in the last few years, we've seen uh, manufacturers uh, provide these room correction products, and uh, if you, they, the, the marketing people claim if you set them up and measure according to instructions, you'll get perfect sound. So to test this, we went out and bought some some uh, commercial products, and we uh, we designed a listening experiment. where each one of these was evaluated compared to a, a situation where there was no equalization. So we took a loudspeaker that's you know, highly regarded, particularly in the classical community, and uh, this, this was the loudspeaker that we're going to equalize. And you can see that this, this speaker is a bit of a challenge because its directivity is not smooth. So you have basically this big hole here uh, because this is not well matched to the tweeter. And this presents a challenge if you're trying to equalize the sound power and fill in this hole, you're going to boost the direct sound by adding a peak here. So your, your room correction device has to figure out how to handle that. There's also a, a resonance here which is, causes a strong coloration in vocals. So hopefully the room correction might try to fix that. And just to make it interesting, we, we added a subwoofer and uh, to see how well these room corrections deal with subwoofers and summing them correctly with the, uh, the main speaker. And we went into our, our reference room and we just focused on one channel to make it uh, an easy, well-controlled experiment. And uh, we did all of our listening in the same seat and uh, we set up each one of these room corrections according to the manufacturer's instructions. We used eight trained listeners. Uh, of course, all the tests were double blind, and we randomized the order in which the programs and room corrections were evaluated. And the results, uh, that's interesting. Sorry, I'm missing a slide here. Uh, I'm missing the slide that has the results. <laughs> uh, I'll have to explain them. So what we found was that uh, three of these room corrections actually improved the sound relative to the un uncorrected speaker. One of them was about the same, and then one of them actually made it significantly worse. So uh, we found that uh, that you know in some time. Most of the cases, it actually improved the sound, but in some cases, it actually made it worse. And uh, so we went into the room after the listening tests were done, and we measured uh, at each seat uh, the average response 
using an array of microphones, and then we just focused these microphones at the listening seat where all the listening was done. And uh, so here we see the results for each of those six uh, room corrections, and from top to bottom are the order in which they were preferred. So the one that was the most preferred, not surprisingly, is also the smoothest, but you can see right away it's not flat. So uh, it actually has this rising low end response. And the one that was preferred second, you know, was not as smooth. The dotted curve here is the speaker without room correction. And you can clearly see that we've got some room resonances here that are making the, the bass very boomy. We've got a big hole here. And you can see that the, the sound power dip from this loudspeaker is clearly, uh, clearly evidence here in the in-room curves. The one that was uh, equally preferred to no correction was this one here, and you can see that uh, it's not as smooth, and unfortunately, they believe that the in-room, uh, that a flat in-room curve is not the desired target. And we also had people rate this perceived spectral balance, and you can see that what they perceive as flat actually has a certain amount of bass increase. So people when they listen to recordings, think uh, they believe that there should be a certain amount of room gain in the playback system in order to make the recording sound natural. And the, the, the room corrections that aim for in-room flat curve, you can see that people are telling us they're thin in the bass. So, so we now have the basis, we believe, for you know, how you should calibrate a loudspeaker in a room in both the professional and the consumer market. Now I want to deviate a little bit and talk now a bit about uh, the preferences of young people today because uh, with, the, uh, with the iPod and the iPhone and, and mobile uh, consumption of audio uh, over the last few years people have argued that kids no longer care about sound quality. And <clears throat> a few years ago there was a uh, Articles in the New York Times, Wired magazine, basically saying that uh, you know the end of high fidelity is, is near, very, uh, very serious in tone. And a lot of this uh, reporting was based on a study that was never published uh, by a guy at Stanford University, Jonathan Berger, and <clears throat> he was giving a presentation on music because this guy is a music professor. He's not a, a psychoacoustic audio scientist. Uh, but he was basically, over the course of seven years, playing MP3 to his students at 128 and asking them to compare it to CD. I, I, I don't know if they were told which was which. I, I suspect they weren't. But what he found was that over, over the course of seven years, more and more of the students preferred MP3 over CD. And uh, this got, basically went viral on the internet, and uh, <coughs> there was articles being written in the New York Times saying, you know, that uh, kids no longer like uh, good quality audio. In fact, they prefer compressed audio. And Berger was speculating that it could be adaptation. What, what, what has become an aberration has become normal for them and they actually prefer it. And I was getting calls from our, our executives and some of our automotive customers were calling us and saying, why are we spending all this money on quality when the kids really want bad sound? You know, we're, we're wasting money on research. And I said, well, based on what? And I couldn't find any studies. I, I tried to contact Jonathan Berger and I didn't get a response. So fortunately, I uh, had people visiting me at the time. I got a call from a high school one day and three or four colleges called and they wanted to come on a, on a field trip, so I said, fine, uh, but there's no free lunch. So we had uh, 58 students in total uh, visit us, and they varied in terms of their experience, so we had high school students who had no critical listening experience. experience. We had some undergrad students studying sound for film and television from Loyola Marymount, and they had some critical listening experience. We also had some master students studying sound for theater from UC Irvine, and uh, they'd actually taken a critical listening course, so I considered them to be the most trained. And then we had some visual arts students from CalArts who had no experience evaluating sound. And this test was very simple. We, we ran them through 12 trials, 
where they heard A and B, and one of them was the original CD version, and the other one was MP3 at 128. And we simply said, which one do you prefer? And of course, we did this over a very, very uh, accurate loudspeaker system, so it was a high quality playback system. And what we found was that if you average all the listeners, uh, you find that in 70% of the trials, they chose CD over MP3. If you look at the individual groups, you find that the most experienced listeners chose CD in 86% of the trials, and the less experience they had in critical listening, the fewer amount of trials they picked CD. But if you look at the individual listeners, you can see that none of them had a significant preference for MP3. Most of them were either guessing or they were uh, choosing CD in more than 50% of the trials. So, in conclusion, I found no evidence that any of these students preferred MP3. What about loudspeakers? If, if they like high quality CD uh, recordings, do they like to hear them through accurate loudspeakers? So while they were there, I ran them through a speaker test. And in this case, uh, sometimes there are some breaks in life that the least expensive speaker here is actually the most accurate one based on measurements. And the most expensive one is the least accurate. So <clears throat> we ran these students through the tests, and I added to the test uh, some Japanese college students who were visiting uh, from Japan at a local college. And they didn't speak English, so we had translators, and they, they went through the test. And I was interested because one of our customers in Japan has argued that we need to tune our cars differently for the Japanese market uh, than the American, U.S., and European market based on the hypothesis that the Japanese listeners prefer less bass, brighter sound. And again, I asked for some evidence, you know, and they could produce none. It was all antidotal. And it's largely based on the fact that in Japan, uh, there's very low sales and subwoofers. And my speculation is that uh, they live in high density housing and because of the, the plight, uh, nature of their culture, they don't like to disturb their neighbors with booming bass. Uh, of course, in America, we don't really care about our neighbors. It's, it's <laughs> loud sound with booming bass is part of the Fifth Amendment, I believe, <laughs> and with carrying guns. And if they don't like it, you can always shoot them. <laughs> so, so we ran this test through these, uh, these various students. And of course, it was a double-blind test, so they can't see the speakers. And each speaker is put into the exact same position. And we, uh, what we found was that, on average, uh, they preferred A, which was the most accurate loudspeaker. So that was encouraging. And then if we look at the individual groups, we found that uh, the high school students preferred A, the, the first set of Japanese students preferred A, the second group preferred A, the CalArts students preferred A, so we're very consistent across these different groups. And what we found, as we find time and time again, the more training they have, the lower they tend to rate things on the scale. So as the training goes up, the scores come down, but the overall rank order is the same, regardless of whether they're from Japan or if they've had training. Oops. And if you look at the measurements, again, I apologize, these are kind of faint, but hopefully you can see that the speakers that are the most neutral, uh, extended in bandwidth, and smooth off axis tend to be the speakers that are preferred. And this is completely predictable from this predictive model I've developed that looks at these measurements and predicts the listener scores. So the good news is that good sound is, is not lost on Generation Y. Young, young kids like good sound. Uh, the problem is we've done a poor job at selling it to them. Uh, we, we're selling convenience and portability over quality and uh, with the demise of uh, big box stores and audio boutiques, they no longer have opportunities to go and listen to products. Uh, they're ordering them on Amazon and, and so on. So we have to figure out how to educate young people about good sound. If you have any ideas, I'd be happy to listen to you. So now we move on to headphones. I've talked about loudspeakers and you know, some of the issues with rooms. 
Uh, but the reality is more and more people now listen to things on headphones. And uh, I think last year headphone sales were $8.2 billion. So uh, more and more listening is done uh, mobily. And, uh, but if you look at the research literature, there's very little work being done in headphones. Uh, it's been quite a few years. So just like loudspeakers, there's no meaningful standards in how to evaluate them, how to measure them. Uh, the standards that, that you look at, they're not really standards, but recommendations on how to measure and calibrate them. And the two common ones are diffuse and free field. Uh, doing listening tests on headphones is really challenging, as, as we found out, uh, because you can't, it's not like a loudspeaker where you can hide them behind a curtain and, and hide the, uh, the brand names. It's, uh, it, it, there's a challenge. So we looked at, uh, we basically uh, set forth some research questions, and again, uh, you know, how do we do listening tests? How do we measure them? Is there a preferred target response like we found there is for a loudspeaker? Maybe the headphone target response should be the same as a loudspeaker since most recordings are actually uh, monitored and optimized to sound good through loudspeakers. And then uh, with the, the popularity of headphones like Beats, uh, our marketing department really questioned whether uh, college kids like the same sound as, a, as an older person. And uh, finally, uh, we've also looked at different tastes of cultures because that, that's, that's an ongoing question. So in the last uh, 18 months, we've done a lot of research, and you can look, look at these preprints you know, for the details, but I'm just going to briefly cover some of the highlights. So the first paper we did was whether trained listeners agree on what a headphones should sound like, and we, we went out and bought some popular headphones and uh, basically did a listening test to see what listeners, how they, how they would rate them. And the method we used was uh, Basically, the listener would come in, we would hide the headphones, and the test administrator would basically substitute these different headphones from behind. So the listener really had no knowledge of what, what they were listening to. Uh, but you know, I have to point out these were not strictly blind tests because the listener could tell the headphone based on the weight. They would know, oh yeah, that's the heavy one, that's the one that feels like my head's in a vice, or that's the loosey floppy one. So. So there were tactile comfort uh, fit, fitment cues that, some, that are possibly biasing their judgment of sound. So what we found, if you look at the, the mean results averaged across all the listeners, we found that there was a clear preference of, between these headphones. And the ones that listeners tended to prefer were the ones that had the smoothest uh, curves. The ones like HP5, HP6, these are very popular, but they're very colored. And they've got big holes. This one's got a big uh, boom in the base. And what these dotted curves are, are the perceived spectral balance of the headphones. So listeners are telling us this one's boomy. This one's also boomy. This one's very flat, very smooth. This is a LSR monitor. These are anechoic measurements, of course. And then our consumer speakers are also basically designed and measured to the same targets. So. And then if you look at large venues, this is actually uh, measured. Uh, you can see that this is pretty smooth here, but what, what it does have is a rather large bass boost, and this is basically designed by the, the mixer or the guy tuning the system, and it's basically to impress the customer. Uh, when the mixer goes in, he can make it whatever he wants, but uh, basically it's very smooth other than this artificial bass boost. The control room is also very smooth. Uh, it's too bad you can't see these. This is a state-of-the-art car audio system, and you can see it's very smooth at the driving position. And then the home theater is, is very similar. So, uh, so we, the circle of confusion is really under control, I think. Uh, these curves are more visible. So. Here's an example of a JBL M2 measured anechoically in a Rebel. So if the, if the music is made through this system and it's played back through this system, uh, the, the consumer is going to hear the art as the artist intended. So we have the creation of the art and the pr preservation of the art because we've, we've designed speakers to a similar target. 
But what we really need at this point is a meaningful speaker and a headphone standard that are common to both professional and consumer audio industries. And it's only then until, and it has to be widely adopted as well, and only then will we hear a more consistent quality of recording and a more consistent reproduction of that recording.